So I have to apologize now, some of this talk is actually pre-web. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about the actual beginnings of the internet, because without the internet there would be no web, would there? And I think it's actually interesting when you see the evolution of how a lot of this got developed, because you may be the next developers of the next cool thing. And sometimes you don't even realize it in the beginning, it's kind of fascinating how history catches up with you. Let's see if this works. So basically, the dinosaur age, pre-internet. So originally, the internet was called ARPANET. It was created by the Defense Department of the United States, basically as a communication infrastructure to survive nuclear war. Um, most people here are probably too young to remember the Cold War, but when I was growing up, we used to hide under our desks in elementary school for the nuclear bombs that were gonna fall. Um, I know it sounds really funny, but this is a big motivation for the government to develop a completely distributed, decentralized communication network that would survive everything. Um, and it was basically only the Defense Department. So most of us hadn't really heard about it, but a lot of the technology is where it actually started. And so kind of pre-web, there were still a lot of communication technologies that a lot of us were using that I guess is where some of the motivations came from for getting in the internet. So Usenet, believe it or not, these days it's called Google Groups, but Usenet was one of the original distributed messaging, communication platforms and stuff. And the entire thing ran by copying messages between computers over computer modes. It was pretty primitive. But a lot of us communicated that way. We met fellow developers with like interests and things. And it was kind of a way that we all started forming informal development teams for a lot of technology that came about later. Um, everybody's heard about AOL, of course. The free floppy disks in the United States, you go to your mail and be a floppy disk. Ooh, one month free dial up access, and a 300 baud modem. You can imagine that kind of stuff. Um, the Well was actually one of the first hacker created communication networks. Um, I use hacker in the old definition, not people that break into computers. My definition of hacker is people that like to solve, come up with creative solutions for difficult problems. Um, hackers are really, really fun people. And then the well that most of us had accounts on the well instead of a big corporate AOL. Um, we started building really good communities of people that were very interested in, I would say, the communication aspects of the technology. Um, and then lo and behold, the government decided that, well, we're going to open up the ARPANET for research. And so they created this thing called NSFNet, National Science Foundation. And it was kind of interesting because although it had Defense contractors, nasty people building things that kill people, not very much fun. Um, they decided to give access to university research groups. They thought for some reason students would be really glad to communicate with each other, which um, as a student was really great fun to be honest. Um, and back in those days, there wasn't a whole lot of communication infrastructure, email, people still do email, some of us, that's all we do. Um, but NSF that was kind of fascinating because Although it was run by the government specifically for research, you had to be doing a government-oriented research project in your university, we all had friends at universities. And so when most of us left college, we could call up our friends in the IT department and stuff like that and say, hey, can I have dial-up access so I can still check my email and stuff? And the government kind of didn't really care because it wasn't commercial, right? We were communicating with each other. We would plan parties, yes, and climbing trips and other things like that. But, um, but the cool thing was a lot of us started gaining this ability to communicate with each other regardless of geographical limitations and things like that. And it was kind of fascinating because the government didn't really kind of care. Um, and in those days too, there weren't any websites. There are these things called FTP Gopher Archives. Anybody know what FTP is? Okay, so FTP and Gopher Archives were kind of fascinating. I ran a FTP Gopher Archive. Um, Funny long story, um, I, I do a lot of climbing and stuff, and so I had an FTP archive of mountain climbing photos. Well, the problem was you couldn't actually see any of the pictures because you had to download them over your 300 baud modem. And if you download the wrong one, you go, oh man, I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> so, it, was, it was kind of painful and it was kind of boring, but we all thought this was really cool high technology. Well, I can download climbing pictures. What a neat use of government funded networking. <laughs> um, but funny enough, for myself personally, 
this was kind of my initial involvement in the internet. So um, I'll be honest, history is kind of boring, but I think our personal experiences through this history is a lot more interesting. And so I just have to explain that some of what I'm going to say is my own experiences. I wasn't the only one doing these things. There's many other people that had similar stories, people that I worked with, people I never met and stuff. And so just realize that if it sounds like I did all this really cool key stuff, there are a lot of other people involved. I was just part of the crowd, so to speak. Um, and that's what really made it kind of fun. Working in a team of people was pretty awesome. So in the beginning, so to speak, CERN is a research group in Switzerland. And Tim Berners-Lee decided he wanted a way to transmit information. So a guy named Ted Nelson had invented this thing called hypertext, um, actually long before the 1990s, mid-80s. And he had a company called Xanadu that spent 10 years building a internet-linked website that never, ever got started. And so Tim Berners-Lee, in about a year and a half, kind of invented HTTP and HTML and, and killed Xanadu as a project. Ted is pretty upset. It's pretty funny. Um, but CERN originally wrote the original Web Server 91 and the original version of the HTTP protocol. And so um, back then there was one command in HTTP protocol that was called get. <laughs> and that was basically all you could do. And HTTP and HTML was pretty primitive. So HTML had 12 tags. Think about that. It was title, header, paragraph. <laughs> um, that was basically about it, not much. And just as a funny side note, um, Linux got started that year. Linux and the internet kind of grew up together in a sense, and I think in a lot of ways it was kind of important. So anyway, so at this point, the internet was still basically you know, run by the government National Science Foundation, but as I said, they kind of forgot about those of us who were using it. As long as you didn't do business traffic, i.e. transfer money over the internet, the government kind of just looked the other way. They thought it was kind of cool to encourage us, or maybe they just didn't really care and stuff. But um, one of the funny things that happened for me was, in 1989, with some hacker friends of mine, we started the first um, free software business in the world. Um, we basically wrote the, uh, the GNU toolchain, GCC, and in 1989, we started the company, and we needed a way to communicate because we had no office. We all worked at home, spread out, mostly across North America. We had a few European employees. And so we were communicating email, kind of not really commercial, but kind of business topic data, which was kind of dangerous. Um, and then the funny thing that happened in 1991, we started talking to the National Science Foundation about allowing business access. And so, um, a funny thing, I one time sat in a meeting with the head of the National Science Foundation, and I'm like, you know, I think commercial use access to the internet would be kind of a really good thing. We want to use the internet for business. And the head of the National Science Foundation goes, why do you think anybody would use the internet for commercial business traffic? She lost her job a couple years later. <laughs> <laughs> so, Somehow, myself and other people, because I said there's many people involved in this lobbying campaign, it took us about 18 months. And the National Science Foundation decided to create kind of a Siamese twin that they called ANSNet. And ANSNet was going to be a commercial research network. The only problem is it had no connectivity to anything, so it actually didn't work. <laughs> it was kind of weird. So we got really frustrated because legally, oh, we could do this legally, but actually, we can't do anything. And if we actually do anything commercial, we're kind of going to get in trouble. So we kept at it, we kept at it. So the beginning of the coal part, um, 1992, the thing called KIX, the Commercial Internet Exchange, founded by uh, my friend Mitch Kapoor, who wrote Lotus 123 Spreadsheet, if anybody's ever heard of that, uh, myself and a few other people, um, created the Commercial Internet Exchange and actually got some friends of ours at a place called BBN Networks in Boston to give us a connection. And suddenly, we could do legal commercial traffic over the internet and talk about business stuff and things like that. And we're like, wow, this is pretty cool. Um, in an interesting way, one of the first business transactions we ever did was um, basically the compiler support. So I had a customer in Taiwan. They actually, well, we send a box of floppy disks to Taiwan, and they would sit in customs for five or six months. And they're like, wow, we want that compiler update. And we're like, well, complain to your customs office. And then we're talking to my customer one day, and I'm like, do you know anybody who's got this thing called an internet connection? And he's like, oh yeah, I, think I know somebody down the city, you know, in Taiwan, and I think he's got internet. I'm like, 
You can download our distribution and bypass the customs office. Maybe I'll get in trouble for that. So anyway, he went there and he downloaded the software, which I think is probably the first internet software download ever. <laughs> um, legal, at least, anyway. So um, I suddenly realized that this is way better than arguing with custom offices and countries. I mean, that's a compiler. Who really cares about it, right? It's not national security. Um, but Kix was pretty fascinating. It was kind of the beginning of the end. And over 1992, we developed from one access point to three. All your messages rattled through these three access points. Boy, was it slow. We thought it was pretty cool. Um, so the problem, though, was that connected to a commercial internet exchange, you had to be a networking company. So also in 1992, I founded my own networking company. Um, probably, the, I think it was the first one in Colorado, at least where I live, um, is, and it's still running after all these years, believe it or not. Um, it's kind of interesting. But yes, yeah, so this is kind of the beginning of the web as we actually know it. Um, and mind you, we saw the certain web server out there and things like that, but things were just really starting to kick in and be fun. So 93 was the big year. So, oh, now it's all legal, right? And believe it or not, um, a lot of people were using the research version of the web server at CERN, even though it was not very good. And so NCSA, the National Supercomputer Center in Chicago, Illinois University, they decided to write their own web server. Don't know why. But anyway, it kind of started in 92. Some of these dates were a little vague. But when I saw this web server, then they also wrote this thing called Xmosaic, which is actually the first decent web browser. And it had one really cool feature. It had images. Oh my god, they could look at my climbing pictures and download only what they wanted. At that point, we got up the 9600 ball. <laughs> um, and so this is actually kind of the real beginning of the internet. Believe it or not, there were actually thousands of people starting to use the internet. Thousands, believe it or not, not millions, <laughs> billions. But oh, this thing's a point or two. Um, and so this is kind of pretty cool. But NCSA server. It's written by a bunch of college students, by the way. Just remember, college students can do technology that changes the world, so think about that sometimes. Um, and back in then, my company sent support to GCC support. We thought this web stuff was pretty cool. People were like, oh man, it's kind of neat. You're using it for downloading and climbing pictures and junk. And so that year, 1993, my company put a Christmas tree on the internet, um, which sounds really boring, right? Um, and so basically, we had these things called X10 controllers, really simple home automation systems that we used to use for rebooting hardware in our build farm for testing compilers and things like that. So we hooked up all these X10 controllers to Christmas tree lights on a Christmas tree. We had a whole bunch of canned images of various states of the Christmas tree. There was no video. And basically, we could change the lights on the Christmas tree, and people on the internet could watch the Christmas tree lights change. And it's Sounds pretty boring compared to the stuff that most of you probably do these days and stuff. It got worldwide press. Wow, that's amazing! Interactive internet! Look at the Christmas tree! <laughs> kind of mind-boggling, to be honest. Um, I still have the source code for that. <laughs> um, and then the other thing I did in 93 was, um, I created my first website, which is still running. It's been continuously running since 1993. Probably the oldest continuously running website on the planet. All for climbing pictures. So it's good. <laughs> the only downside is it still looks like it was written in 1993. <laughs> <laughs> I had people tell me that, but I'm too late. I haven't done an update in 20 some years anyway. Um, but this is really the beginning of the web kicking in. As I said, we are still talking about tens of thousands of people, but people are starting to really see the possibilities for this, and it was also now finally legal. So. Basically, the college students who wrote NCSA server and XMosaic, they did this really weird thing. They kind of graduated. <laughs> and so a couple of the college students, um, one of them, Mark Andrelson, got together with Jim Clark, founder of um, Silicon Graphics, and they started a small company called Netscape. Um, Netscape was basically the original decent browser. XMosaic was okay, but it only ran on some workstations. Kind of limited. Netscape was kind of cool because it ran on this weird operating system called Windows. Um, and so it was kind of popular with people. And at that same year, we started seeing other commercial companies jumping on the web. Amazon, go figure. Maybe that's why they're huge. Um, PHP, anybody have programmed in PHP anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do this. Um, at the same point, there was no layout. You, you 
couldn't really do a whole lot with it. Um, InfoSeq was created as the first search engine on the planet. InfoSeq was kind of interesting. There was no web spider. So if you wanted to be in the InfoSeq search engine, you had to email them your URL, and they would add you to the database. Um, and then GeoCities was created, which was the first free web hosting organization. They actually died a couple of years ago. But you could go to GeoCities, get a little bit of disk space, and write a free website long before Facebook existed. And it was pretty cool because at this point you started seeing hobby websites appearing and initial corporate websites, other people actually using the internet for distributing more information. And this was when things were kind of getting kind of cool. It was like really starting to kick in. But you couldn't really do much still. I mean, Netscape was kind of funny because Netscape said, you know, 12 tags isn't really enough. We're going to have a lot more tags. That was kind of a problem because they weren't standard. And then this other little company called Microsoft wrote this stupid thing called the Internet Explorer. And they said, you know, we don't like the Netscape tags. We're going to do a different set of tags. So it got kind of weird because depending which browser you use, the websites wouldn't work at all. They eventually fixed this problem. But for a long time, it was kind of a headache of incompatibility and stuff. But we didn't care because it actually worked at all. We thought that was kind of cool by itself. So in 95, things were starting to really, really kick in. So when NCSA server was written by a bunch of college students, those of us working on the code base and stuff um, would submit patches to it, right? I mean, we're all software developers. We'd find a bug and we'd submit it. But we weren't students, so they wouldn't take our patches. We got kind of frustrated, especially because they'd stop work on it. And so we forked the NCSA server code into Apache. It was called Apache. It's not named after Native American tribe. It's because it's our Apache server. Um, I know, it's kind of a broader, but that's the way it is in the geek community sometimes. And basically, um, AltaVista was the next cool search engine. So they built AltaVista to replace InfoSeq. There were still no spiders and stuff, so you still had to email your links. AltaVista was kind of a really, at the time, kind of fast search engine. It was mostly to demonstrate the really screaming computer hardware and stuff like that. Um, eventually, Netscape and Microsoft kind of beat it out and kind of standardized on HTTP1 and start standardizing on a lot of tags, like they had the same image tags finally and things like that, although there's still differences in your browsers. And then, oh, Java applets, the most obscene obscenity of the internet ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, Java applets are really good for sucking all the memory out of your computer <laughs> and making you grind to a halt. But it was kind of interactive, right? Like we still had no ability to do layout. We could do paragraph and lists and headers one, two, and three, and stuff like that. Um, and JavaScript got started. JavaScript was originally based on a specification called ECMAScript 262, or, yeah, 262, and stuff like that. And so JavaScript was pretty bad. The performance was pretty abysmal, but we could actually start doing stuff that kind of talked to the web browser on a much higher level of technology and stuff. Um, and it was kind of interesting, because we're now finally getting where we could really do kind of cool stuff, Java notwithstanding. It was still better than what we had. Um, and then Yahoo was created, because mind you, there are no search engines. And believe it or not, by 95, the internet was kind of starting to get pretty big. And so Yahoo was a web portal. There's no free search engines. You had to go to Yahoo, and they would tell you what was interesting. Um, it's like, oh yeah, here's the news for the day, and stuff like that. And it was pretty simple. Unfortunately, they're kind of dying these days and going away. But anyway, so that was, and they started doing free email, which was also a big deal for a lot of people at the time. Um, but this is really the beginning, I think, of, of the commercial internet as we think about it, because we can actually do cool stuff with it. So 1996 started to get really kicked in. There was this other obscenity called Adobe Flash. Um, so I'll be honest, I hate Flash. I hate Flash so much, I wrote my own Flash player. <laughs> um, so you guys might have heard about it. I wrote a thing called Ganache. Um, Ganache was a 100% reverse engineered implementation of the Adobe Flash player. And let me tell you, from being into the guts of Adobe Flash, boy, is it ugly. Funny enough, it was based on the same API as JavaScript. Um, it also did a lot of interactive graphics. Um, and at the time, it actually, in spite of its faults, made the internet a much more programmable, dynamic thing. And lo and behold, it started doing simple video. Mind you, at this point, we're on 14.4K modes. Because um, most people dialed up for internet access. You couldn't really get an internet connection in your household. I might have fiber to my house, but I'm weird. Um, and then there's a couple of things that finally got added to HTTP and HTML that actually started making it 
more useful. So they added frames. Frames is another great obscenity in web pages. My website still uses it. <laughs> um, and tables. Tables was kind of the first ability to start actually laying out data. The funny thing about tables was, some of you older folks might remember, there was a frame when everybody used tables for layout, and all web pages said, best viewed by 800 by 600 resolution. And if you resized your browser window, everything would go to hell. <laughs> it was kind of fun to play with it late at night and stuff. Um, CSS basically started coming out. Forms, you could actually do data input back into your web page. I know that sounds really funny. Forms is like the first ability to make it more interactive without having to use Flash. Um, file uploading, you couldn't upload files in the data. Well, now we can upload files in, in, in our, by typing a name in our form. We thought this was pretty cool. Sounds kind of boring. Backgrounds for web pages, because up till then they're all white backgrounds and not much else interesting stuff. Um, and so the internet was, and the web in particular, was actually getting kind of useful in spite of the shitty technology involved in a lot of the guts of it all. Um, but this is, uh, this is kind of a big deal. And I'll be honest about this time. I'm not a web developer, I'm actually a systems engineer, so this is kind of funny that I'm at a web conference. <laughs> I've always been more focused on putting the data out on the wire, so to speak. And if you look at my website, you can really tell that I'm not a web designer. <laughs> it's still fun, I keep my website still running and things like that. I still run my own web server on my own hardware, just because I don't know how to stop. So. <laughs> And then the other big thing, 1998, style sheets. Ooh, we could actually get even better control than CSS allowed. And this other small company called Google. Um, <laughs> so Google is pretty funny. Um, my business, Sigma Support, had an office a couple blocks from Stanford University. And we used to have a group of people called the Cypherpunks. Cypherpunks was a Silicon Valley-based group of like-minded, crazy computer hackers that would get together once a month and drink heavy amounts of alcohol and talk about cool technology. And these two crazy college students, Sergey and Larry, came to one of our parties to demonstrate this thing they'd just written in their dorm room that they thought we'd all be interested in. And we're like, who cares about that? We screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard to, I mean, Google's obviously still a search engine, but boy, is Google a lot more than a search engine these days. Um, but this is actually a whole different thing. One of the cool things I mentioned about Google is, even back in that day when they actually got funding, got out of college and started a business, was they had this thing which I kind of recommend for the few people that have businesses. They allowed employees to spend 20% of their time working on projects of whatever they wanted. This is where Gmail came from. This is where the calendar apps came from. These were somebody's hobby projects they did off the side of their main job. And Google said, hey, that's kind of a cool idea. And I think that that 20% time from their employees was a huge, huge time of innovation. And I think if they had not allowed that, the internet would be different to this very day. Um, I think something I've mentioned to other people in other talks is, you know, when you have a passion for something, you should kind of go do it. You should follow that. Because while everybody may tell you you're crazy, I mean, we started a free software business, people thought we were really crazy. You're gonna give your software away and ask for money? Are you nuts? Of course we were nuts, it's the best part of it. <laughs> um, but I think that 20% really let people do it. They had good resources. And Google, to be honest, business-wise, was smart enough to adopt these various little side projects to where now it's pretty crazy, although it's hard to believe it's all paid for by advertising. Sorry for people that make money on advertising. <laughs> it's kind of destroyed the internet, but also pays for it, so I guess I can't complain. It. <laughs> so, Basically, at this point, you know, I'll be honest, I kind of went back to GCC development, a lot of Linux development, and things like that. Um, and so, you know, the future, you guys have already seen a lot of talks about the future. A lot of you are building some of those technologies that will be the future. But just as a curiosity, some of the technology you're all using isn't that old. Well, maybe old to you guys, but to me it seems kind of new. Facebook. <laughs> I won't talk about Facebook. <laughs> um, I can't tell if Facebook made or destroyed the internet, it's kind of complicated. Um, YouTube, which is another funny thing. Um, I tried to, uh, so in 1999, we actually sold uh, my company's Sigma support to Red Hat, and so I wound up actually selling a competitor to YouTube. They won the war. <laughs> uh, it's kind of interesting, and then funny enough, my Ganesh Flash player wound up being the only usable YouTube video player for open source developers. Um, 
which unfortunately I spent seven years watching YouTube videos all day, every day. Talk about boring. Oh my God. You have to watch the same video look for latency <laughs> and bugs. Oh my God. You can only watch so many dancing cat videos. It's like ridiculous. Um, they're actually really good because if the cat didn't dance right, you knew you had latency problems. Um, Ruby on Rails, the movie programmers here. Never used Ruby on Rails, but I know it's quite popular. Um, no JS. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm not a Node.js JavaScript programmer. I've been kind of learning it lately. Whew, what a mess of nasty dependencies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was invented by somebody who was schizophrenic and drank too much coffee. <laughs> but, um, and, and the nice thing too is, and then people started really realizing beyond the Flash video truly sucked. And so um, the beginnings of HTML5 and stuff, um, 2012. Didn't have really good support in those days. I mean, there was this cool talk about doing these things called canvases. And it's like, yeah, I think I'll add video support. Boy, I really psyched about HTML5. All my funding for Ganache dried up, and I had to go back to a real job for a living. Um, and it's actually pretty nice, too, because a lot of the HTML5 was pretty decently designed. A lot of the performance problems that we had had doing streaming video on the internet went away. Also, bandwidth went up, which helped a lot, too. <laughs> Um, and so I think HTML5 is pretty good. I'm sure there's people working on HTML6. I don't know. I'm kind of not into the standards and in the industry anymore. I'm retired. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, this is basically a lot of this stuff is really the last 10 or 15 years. It's not really that far back. Um, and who knows what we're going to be in another 5 or 10 years. It's kind of mind-boggling to think about. Am I running out of time yet? <laughs> So, um, so anyway, that's basically my spiel on having lived through the history and stuff like that. Um, I'll be honest, the late 80s and early 90s was a fascinating time to be a software engineer. Um, there was so much innovation going on in all parts of the industry. New microprocessor architectures. Open source really kicked in pretty strong. And open source kind of grew up with the web servers and the web and the internet. And I think that's what's really amazing is because so much of the web technologies is open source, it's been a really great enabler, right? It keeps your cost of entry low to doing business. Um, and it's just pretty fascinating. As some of the other talks today, people are still walk, working on the next generation, some pretty amazing technology and stuff. It's pretty cool. I mean, most of the talks today, they're way above my head. Oh my God. I mean, you can ask me how to boot computers, right? I don't know much about any of this really fancy stuff. So, um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, I don't really know where the web is going, but if anybody has any questions, um, go for it. <laughs> or find me later. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so if you get really bored, you can go to my website and download Tommy Pictures still. <laughs>